Welcome to I'd Print That. I'm Andrew. I'm Joe. We have had a good week. We've ma- actually managed to get the power supply modified for Andrew's Da Vinci. It now has a 450 watt power supply. We're going to have post some pictures of the install on our Instagram page. Mm-hmm. Andrew has more goodies for more his goodies, Da Vinci. Yeah. They came in faster than I... Um, actually, the funny thing was I was complaining because they've been so spoiled by Amazon Prime with two-day shipping. This is the first thing I've ordered that wasn't Prime for probably a year. <laughs> and so uh, this wasn't due to come in until next week, middle of next week. But the E3D V6 all-metal hot end for direct drive is in my hand right here. It's very cool. It's shiny. It came with the entire kit. came with a heater cartridge, the thermistor, wiring, a fan, fan shroud. And this thing, I do have to say, as far as 3D printer parts goes, this thing is freaking cool looking. It just, it's nice. The machining looks nice on it. The fins that the fan shroud clips on, just for, you don't get heat creep up the barrel, uh, which is the main problem that the, the Da Vinci hot end has. It's just beautiful. Yeah, if you haven't seen what one of the E3D V6 hot ends look like just pop on out to amazon do a quick product search and you'll find them yeah they're cool uh, funny enough they're a lot smaller than i expected it to be because you do lose i want to say it's like 0.5 build height okay with mounting this and i believe it's just the way it mounts um, actually we also have the printed parts that are needed to uh, retrofit the da vinci carriage to where you can just literally with very minor modifications to the carriage bolt this hot end in yeah there's some some soldering that's required you gotta install a new thermistor gotta run a 12 volt lead for the the fan but the great thing is is with the new power supply that we put in we've got some standalone 5 and 12 volt rails that we can use and just for whatever we want mm-hmm. of course one of them's taken up by the fan uh the fa- the fan for the psu that rail i made separate oh cool and you'll see in the pictures, you can check them out on the website as well as our Instagram. I'll post a photo collage of before and after pictures, but it's going to look stock. There are very few minor um, additions that Joe made when he installed it. The main one being that if you look at this and you know what a DaVinci looks like, are the two LEDs that show standby and power on for the power supply that we added. And then on the side, on the non-filament loading side... It'd be the, the right-hand side as you're looking at it. Yeah. Uh, there'll be a fan duct. And Joe actually had a really good idea because the sides on this machine actually overlap the back plastic. And then we're just going to print a fan duct yeah. that goes straight through that. And so it's it won't have to try to pull air out of the inside of the machine as well as outside air. Right. That'll look really cool. Joe did an amazing job. I have to say hats off to you, friend. Thank you. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I try and do good work. So, yeah, we were able to take, and in the back of the Da Vinci, there were two holes between the filament wells and the bed chamber. I wound up mounting the power supply over one, and I wanted to to do something with the other hole because I knew that we're going to be into those filament wells, and I didn't want anything to get into the chamber to to potentially spoil a print. So what I did is I just cut off the side of the power supply that wasn't used that had the model information for the power supply itself and tapped a couple of holes and bolted it right over that second opening. So yeah. now it's a, the, the back is entirely enclosed. And it's... That's when Joe and I sat down last podcast and we tore this thing apart and went over what we wanted to do. We both agreed that it would be neat for it to look stock. Mm-hmm. Just like I said, if if you know what a Da Vinci looks like and know your way around one, you'll you'll tell few few very subtle differences. But I love being able to use the space that is available rather than just trying to bolt it on the back, which honestly in the beginning, that's what I thought I would do. I would just print an enclosure for it and uh, make it look as good as possible. But no, not the case at all. No, we're able to in that second, in that second filament well, it's unused. Once the shroud came off that power supply, there's plenty of clearance to mount it in there and it looks amazing. Yeah, it does. But yeah, we've got the parts printed. Need to do a couple, few minor things. I need to go get some miscellaneous little screws and bolts, nuts. Mm -hmm. And then uh, literally it's going to be tear down the carriage and get to it. That carriage tear down is going to take some time. Probably have to do it over the next week or two. It looks to be pretty involved, but I haven't seen the video. He's got it broken up into 
five or more pieces. Mm-hmm. You know, there's well, actually, and I've actually this particular machine I've had to pull the carriage off of, mm-hmm. incidentally, because I replaced all those uh, bearing holders. Right. Because that those are the ones that crack that causes you to not be able to print round uh, round circles. Mm-hmm. So I've already torn this machine down almost to that point, and actually I've had this particular machine had that really bad clog. Right. And I did have to pull the hot end. It's kind of in a little cartridge, the way it works out in these. They have actually a little spring-loaded clamp that you depress, clip a couple uh, zip ties, and the whole hot end comes out. And I did the... Whew, that talk, t- Tell you what, I, I've never seen a printer clog this bad. I ended up having to take a drill bit and drill out the filament mm-hmm. um, just to get it cleared enough. And I remember texting Joe. I said, I'm going to turn this thing up to 11 and see what the happens. Right. I just cranked that thing up, hoping just to melt out the filament that was stuck in there. So I, I don't think the teardown on this is going to be bad. I do know there's a couple things that you do need to look out for. And one thing is when you're assembling the E3D, because it does come as a full kit, uh, and you have to put the heater in the block, and you also have to solder the thermistor in. And I've heard... Quite a few people say it can be hard to get a good solder on the thermistor mm-hmm. uh, and get it in there. Hopefully we don't have any problems with that. Yeah, that's where I want to sit down and take a look at the, the video ahead of time. Cause yeah, and honestly, it's gonna, I think it's going to be a culmination of videos. Mm-hmm. Just a couple of videos on actually assembling an E3D. Mm-hmm. And this is, I don't, and I've said it a few times, but this is the ED, E3D V6 all metal. It's not the Volcano or the... Uh, the V6 light even. This is the the full Monty, if you will. It's a beautiful little hot end. <laughs> <laughs> it looks nice. It really does. But yeah, uh, hopefully we'll get some time uh, next week after work or something. We can take some time out and yeah, take a night or two and yeah. check it out. But yeah, it's uh, we're almost there. And this is, I was just telling Joe about this, the multiple times that we were just talking about random stuff and then we told each other we should probably start a podcast because we're talking about things we're going to talk about (laughs) on the podcast. I've wanted to buy one of these little hot ends for this printer since I got it. I've wanted to do this swap forever. And you've been talking about it since you started working with me. Yeah. It's been a conversation that has been had many times. You know, one of these days I'm going to get this and well, Mm -hmm. that day has finally arrived. And it didn't take that long to get to you. It only took a few days. No, no, it didn't. And for me, for the most part, it was I bought an expensive 3D printer. Not so expensive. It's kind of hard to justify throwing extra money at something I already bought just Mm -hmm. because I want to print in different filaments. Right. I was finally able to do it, and it's going to be cool. And as I was telling Joe, I do know that this isn't going to be tenfold resolution. This is going to be I will have more accurate temps. I will have the ability to print in just about any filament because I am putting it as a direct drive. Mm-hmm. Maybe in the future the other machine will become a Bowden just to get the weight off the hot end to take that stepper motor off the extruder so it's not sitting out there. Right. And there's some really simple modifications you can do to these DaVinci's to put a Bowden drive on it. Just to clear up, a Bowden drive remotely pushes the filament. A direct drive has a um, idler wheel and a stepper motor that grabs and it pushes the filament directly into the uh, hot end. And the reason a lot of people like them is just because, like I said, it takes the weight off of them. And also, the one drawback is is flexible filament you can't use very well you have to slow them way, way down to print with a Bowden extruder. And I think you have to turn the heat up a bit on them, too. Oh, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, well, the flexible right out of the, the right out of the gate prints at a much higher temperature. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's happening. It's it's moving along. I would say in a couple of weeks, this thing will be up and printing like it used to be and better. Yeah. There's a few things I want to continue to upgrade on it. It uses brass bushings mm-hmm. rather than uh, uh, slide bearings on all of the smooth rods and I'd like to print new a new carriage for it that will take care of all that put LMAU I believe is the size uh slide bearings to put on them I mean beyond that there's not much I can really do to it you've at least accomplished or will have accomplished two of the things you want to do once you get that V6 hot end on there mm-hmm. yeah definitely and the only other big one that people are doing is they're putting a smoothie board in there rather than the original board Right. And supposedly those smoothie boards do really well. The uh, stepper motor uh, movements are a lot smoother, mm-hmm. a lot less jerky, and just kind of work out better. And that that could possibly be. I mean, it's kind of to the point where it's like, okay, well, I can keep upgrading this machine, 
or I can build an entire new machine. And, and see, and at what point does this stop becoming a Da Vinci and become an Andrew special? <laughs> I, I mean, right now, it, the power supply has changed. Mm-hmm. The hot end is going to be changed. It's no longer running stock firmware. Yeah. The only thing that's any any type of X Y Z is the case itself and the board. Yeah. And other than that, and a few mechanical parts. I mean, I've even like we talked about before. I've already switched out the uh, the bearing captures for the X and Y axis. Right. And actually, I've already printed them the pillow blocks for the smooth rods on the Z axis. Mm-hmm. I just haven't switched them out yet. Yeah. I do think one thing that I did see someone do that was really neat on this was they rather than putting all that plastic on, mm-hmm. they just got acrylic. And they, they, they pulled all this white plastic off the top. They mm. left it on the back because this is kind of nice to enclose this. I think it'd look kind of cool. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. And then the final thing you want to do is the fans and the hand wells. Fans and the hand wells for sure because it, this this particular is a DaVinci 1.0A. Mm-hmm. It has the upgraded extruder where uh, the DaVinci 1.0 is the first gens, which I have one at home, that printed all the parts for the swap over, it didn't have the ability to print PLA at all because it had heat creep so bad it would just clog. It would pre-melt the filament before it got to the nozzle and it just blobbed up in there and you couldn't do anything. Even with the upgraded um, hot end, you still have to have some kind of active cooling in the chamber. Right. Which, that'll be one thing. And that's the beautiful thing, uh, having all of these different Molex connectors from the 12-volt rails, now I can add just regular pc case fans now you do 5 volt and 12 volt on those guys the other thing uh, is the uh, led light strips i'm going to add more lighting into it to make uh, time lapses yeah and better if you go online you'll you should be able to find some 5 volt or 12 volt led led strips that we can put molex ends on and plug straight into those yeah i would probably even do away with the the stock light strips at that point yeah, one of the big things you can tell that the uh, Da Vinci is underpowered was everybody saying, well, the, you can watch the LEDs flicker mm-hmm. while you're heating up. We did a heat up test, and they still flickered. And I think, as Joe pointed out, and we've come to the agreement, they're probably underpowered through the board. Yeah. So I don't believe that that is part of the issue showing that it's underpowered. Yeah, because when you did a warm-up test, there was no flickering of the LEDs. They were all worked just fine. And you heated up with the sides off, with it not enclosed. It was five minutes faster than it would have been beforehand. Enclosed with the lid on, the sides on, everything. And my basement's fairly cold. Yes, it is. (laughs) So. And no, we're not just neckbearders that stay in the basement. No. My basement is, there's no dogs down here. Yes. You may hear sometimes in the background, you'll hear them barking or scratching at the door because they're social dogs. They like company. (laughs) Maybe someday we'll have an office to podcast from. Well, we're sitting in what would be my office. For those of you who have been listening, we're recording this in my unfinished basement. It's storage for the most part. I have plans to to wall off part of it and put my office here. Probably be a lot sooner than later. I was figuring at least. I think that's a summer project. Yeah, spring, summer, yep. We'll get hammered on that, and and that'll only, not only provide us with a more official setting i guess mm-hmm. it, we'll have flooring and then at that point so we're not just on concrete yeah it'll just it'll be nice for us yep it'll be heated too <laughs> <laughs> yeah it'll be a nice little enclosed room versus a big open room that doesn't stay very warm yes and then we have to pause when the heater goes on or the water tank goes on <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah some sound some sound dampening is is sorely needed we'll get those you know what we should do is get those tiles Foam uh, tiles? Yeah. I plan on using some of those, tiles. yeah. It depends on the acoustic. I'm to the point where I have the measurements. I need to put the uh, put them into a 3D design program, SketchUp, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then model it out. Well, the cool thing about SketchUp is I'm pretty sure you can get a uh, an extension, give it the dimensions, and it'll frame it for you, and, and you can get a board foot right from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then you have a design to go off. I mean, I've done construction since high school, but I've never framed a house. <laughs> I haven't either. I've seen it. I've watched it, but it doesn't look too difficult. I've seen many DIY shows, Mm -hmm. and all it is is one wall. I've got three of four walls done, Mm -hmm. so it's one wall and then then drywall. Run power, run data, drywall, uh, mud and tape, paint, paint, and And flooring. Whatever you're gonna do for flooring. 
Uh, yeah, I haven't quite decided that one yet. I've got a couple of designs in my head. It's just deciding which one to stick with. Yeah. It'll be nice for us, though. I mean, a little bit of an upgrade. You'll have you'll finally have your nice big office. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reclaim that room for something. We may take a wall down and expand the bathroom out or expand the laundry out or oh, yeah, do yeah. something with it. Very cool. There's a couple of... Uh, couple of decisions there but that's that's home design that's not <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with 3d printing but it well it kind of does i guess <laughs> so. just to wrap up the da vinci i wanted to i do want to mention uh the guy that i'm following his build that did the e3d v6 his name is Stephen q dash ne dash uk he does a very very detailed he, he even at one point grabs all the parts for his extruder lays them out on a table and says this is the parts that you're going to have these are going to be the parts that you need uh, you need to print this part. You need to cut this part here. And it is, it's just very intuitive for the build for us. Just like printing a model, I'd like to know someone has successfully done it. And without someone successfully printing it, I almost don't even want to waste my time and filament on it. And something like this, this is a big a big change to one of these DaVinci printers. Mm -hmm. And I need to know it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to know I spent the money in vain. If you want to check him out... And he has it all broke out into phases, very easy to digest, not overwhelming you with one particular part at a time. And it's not one big, long, three-hour video either. Yeah, yeah. So he's got it in really nice, easy to do, easy to follow instructions. I mean, I'm following it, so I'll tell you something. <laughs> yeah, and I'll sit down, I'll watch it, and get familiar with what we need to do, and we should be able to get this taken care of. No no sweat. And it should, it'll work really good when we're done. Yeah, can't wait. Besides that, I've got parts on the way for my little Perusa. I've got some new cables coming for my uh, extruders. I talked last week a little about my second extruder, and it looked like when they wrapped the stepper motor, they attached the cables to the stepper motor and then took and wrapped the cables around the motor itself. Mm -hmm. So it looks like those got a little bit of a, a nice pull on them. So where the cable comes into the connection, mm -hmm. it probably broke a couple of those cables. Well, we ran into the same problem with the DaVinci. Right. Where they had pulled the wires too tight and they had zip tied them down so hard mm -hmm. that just movement from the carriage over time broke those wires. No, and that looks like that's what happened to my second extruder. So I contacted the company and... Let them know, hey, I'm having an issue with the second extruder. I've done everything. I've checked voltages, made sure that it's not a voltage issue. I've hooked the, the stepping motor up to one of the other cables. The stepping motor looks fine. And they went ahead and they're sending me actually two new cables so I can swap out both primary and my secondary extruder cables. So I'll go through and I will reinforce those when I get them. That way I don't have the issue of when the carriage moves back and forth, that cable isn't going to bend back and forth and, and break over time. In addition, I noticed that I have a little bit of Z-wobble on that. I was playing around with the extruders and... You know, I'd raise my print head and then lower it, and in the process, I was watching it go up and down, and I could see it rock forward and back. To me, that indicated that something was amiss with one of the uh, thread rods. I went ahead and I looked at the, the, the rods themselves and my Z-rods, and sure enough, both of them have just a slight bend. Mm-hmm. Not a lot, but, you know, it's enough to, to make some, some noticeable wobble. And I said, hey, you know, while you're sending me the the cables, why don't you throw in a couple of Z-rods that aren't bent? I'm nitpicking at this point. But I'm nitpicking because this is a printer that's going to be just my primary printer. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that the product that I get sold is as good as it can be. Yeah. So I want to hold them accountable for it. It's got a warranty, and they've been accommodating to this point. And in addition to that, I've had, and this is, I can't say it's common or uncommon, it's, but it's an issue that I've seen that other people have had is where there are times when the uh, LCD display, when it's on its home screen, it'll scramble the words up, show funny characters on the forums. I check those out. And sure enough, I've found that there's many things that you can try. One of those is if you happen to need to re-update your firmware, that the screen type was incorrect. It would try and use a different screen driver than oh. uh, the screen that the, the, than the uh, printer came with. Huh. So I follow those instructions, looked through the Repetier software, and verified that 
I had the correct screen selected. I re-uploaded the firmware. And after a while uh, of use, I noticed that it would still do the same thing. It's not a thing that would break the printer. If you clicked on the little menu wheel, you went to a sub-menu, it would snap right back. You know, it would be completely readable. It just, for whatever reason, while it was idle, something would happen and it would just derp out. <laughs> they opted to go ahead and send me another GT2560 Arduino board. They're mm -hmm. just replacing the whole motherboard flat out. Those parts should be arriving here, I'd say, probably in the next week. Uh, they are being shipped from China, so it does take a little bit of time to arrive. But the the two bearings and the pulley should be arriving this week. Those left the Los Angeles sorting facility for USPS on the 3rd, and they should be here, I would say, by Friday. Nice. Besides that, it's been idle doing its thing. I've got it in various parts of disassemble right now, waiting for replacement pieces and parts. Yeah, I'm doing my own customizations to it with reinforcing the, the cables and other things like that. One thing that I did do, I made an Amazon purchase. I got some new 40 millimeter fans for it. They're quieter fans. I picked up some, uh, I found the, the wire that they use for the stepper motors. So what I'm going to do is probably make my own custom cables. Mm -hmm. I just need to find the ends that they use. I'm going to shorten those cables up for my Y and my Z. I'm going to make custom length cables for those guys. Yeah, because those are going to be dead on. They gave me cables that were, gosh, two feet long at least. Oh, really? Maybe a meter. They're actually pretty decent sized. I've got to, had to do some clever cable management for those guys. Yeah. But well, past that, we talked a little bit about doing some time-lapse videos last week. Mm -hmm. And I broke down, and I just went ahead and got a GoPro. I wound up dealing with the guy on Craigslist, and I picked up a Hero 3 Plus Silver with, like, 50 accessories, attachments mm -hmm. that came with it. So not a bad not a bad little guy. It has a 64-gig SD card in it. So I went ahead and ordered some additional lighting, which... I'm going to wind up powering off of my printer's power supply. Mm -hmm. Lighting is pretty spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> and I should be able to get some time lapses finished here in the next probably couple weeks. Nice. Speaking of time, this is our eighth episode. It is. This two is full months. Two months. Two months ago, we sat down and started doing this. We're very nervous about talking. Yes. And... I noticed that you're wearing the same, same shirt. shirt. <laughs> yes, I am. Ah, the little things. So, yeah, no, it was, it's, it's been fun. I'm having a great time doing this. And one of my things I was pretty nervous on is finding 3D printing type things to talk about news, goings yeah. on. And we're definitely worried about running out of stuff to talk about. I have had no problems coming up with things. Yeah. I actually had to sit down today. I generally go through my news, and if I find a 3D printing article, something related to 3D printing, I will send myself an email and then compile those into a Google Drive document that Andrew and I have shared between us. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and I compiled all those emails, and I had something like 20 articles. <laughs> I can't go through and talk about all 20 of those today. I will go ahead and on my blog on the website post links to a majority of these articles. There's some that are definitely worth talking about here on the podcast and there's others that they're very informative, but I don't think that they really need to be covered in that much depth. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about, but there's uh, we have to pick and choose. Yeah, we do, we do, definitely. I'd like to say current as possible. Like last week, speaking on the uh, the incident with Luby and Thingiverse. Yeah, with Just 3D Prints, and they're going out to the Thingiverse website and selling all those models on eBay. Yeah, and we want to be able to talk about that stuff and right. be able to keep current. Incidentally, the day after we talked, I saw a notice that the Just 3D Prints account had pulled down all of the models and i do not see anything posted by them at all on one hand you kind of wanted to see that go through well, and an action be taken so then the line's clear clearly drawn in the sand i haven't necessarily seen anything that indicates one way or another i think it might have been 
I don't know if it was a voluntary takedown or not. There's not a whole lot of news with regards to that. And they won't until they come to a conclusion. If Thingiverse did file cease and desist papers and move forward with any type of litigation, then this is what I would have expected to have seen. Mm Mm-hmm. You'll see them stop doing what they're doing, and then they will have time to review the papers with their attorneys and make any counterclaims or anything like that afterwards. I'm not an attorney. I've seen Night Court. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Judy. And like I was saying, to continue what I was saying, was on one hand, you wanted to see this go all the way through just to see this the line clearly drawn, just so everybody knows. Here's the line, you don't cross it. That'd be great. But, but also, I'm happy to see it just kind of die. Right. I believe we're still going to see an end to this. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be very public. Yeah. So... In which it it really shouldn't be. There's no no. reason for it to be. No. As long as there is a cut and dry, this is the line, you shall not cross this line, Mm -hmm. then that's fine. This is so new, and the whole intellectual property only gets us so far, we need to be protected. We do. All of us do. All of us makers, all of us designers. Yes, 3D printing needs publicity. This is the other side of me wanting it to just die because it doesn't need that bad publicity to give it a bad name, give people the bad taste in their mouth about it. Right. Because they're just going to think, oh, all these people are getting 3D printers and they're going to recreate copyrighted items. Right. And we don't want that. That's not what we're trying to accomplish as makers. That kind of brings us into one of the news articles that we have dealing with copyright... This uh, comes from a study from the University of California, Irvine, and they have revealed a surprising fact that the sounds emitted emitted from a 3D printer could be enough to compromise valuable intellectual property, allowing cyber attackers to reverse engineer and recreate 3D printed objects based off nothing more than a smartphone audio recording. Mm Mm-hmm. When it comes to the legal aspects of 3D printing, the majority of the makers are concerned with their intellectual property being illegally appropriated and copied via online platforms. This is basically what we were just talking about with the Thingiverse designers and the eBay reseller Just 3D Prints. According to UCI's findings, however, the designers and manufacturers would not even have to upload their STL files or 3D prints to the web to be victims of IP theft. Provided that the attackers have access to the 3D printer in question, so let's say in the case of a worker at a 3D printing manufacturing plant or a workplace rival, all they would have to do is set up a recording device like a smartphone and those designs are as good as theirs. The research was led by Mohammed al farouk an electrical engineer, computer scientist, and director of UCI's Advanced Integrated Cyber Physical Systems Lab. Say that three times fast. Seriously, right? <laughs> uh, he and his team demonstrated that the acoustic signals emitted by a 3D printer carry unique information about the precise movements of the nozzle, and that information can be reverse engineered to reveal the object's original source code. And they were able to prove that the acoustic information is so precise that Al Farouk and his team were able to recreate a key-shaped object with nearly 90% accuracy using only 3D printers' audio recordings. Yeah, that's... That's actually pretty good. If you're within 90%, and if this is used maliciously, the technique could represent a significant security threat. Right now, there's no reason to become paranoid just yet. It is unlikely that individual makers would be the victims of 3D printing cyber attacks. However, this kind of security breach could pose a bigger threat to companies developing novel 3D printed devices or 3D printing sensitive prototypes. And since the uncovering of their findings, the UCI team has received interest from other departments at UCI as well as from various U.S. government agencies. The research will be officially presented at the ICCPS 2016, taking place in Vienna in April. ICCPS is the International Conference on Cyber Physical Systems. 
It was something that I had actually thought about when I first started printing because as you can as you listen to your printer go through its routine printing, it makes certain sounds. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if those sounds could be decoded in such a way to actually figure out what is being printed. I've listened to videos and you can you'll hear the the print head doing its things and for every movement it makes, it makes its own little buzz or squeak or whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it as the motors and the print head move around the print area. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't surprise me that they have been able to recreate an object based upon purely audio recordings. Yeah, this is another one of those things where it's like, come on, really, guys? I understand the reason and, and why he's looking into this, but we've got better things to do. Let's make more things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this mainly deals with corporate espionage. So. Yeah. Me at my house making my little doodads or you making your stormtrooper gear shift. I don't care. (laughs) Yeah, that's not going to be a big deal. But if you're a company like 3D Systems and you're manufacturing some trademarked items. You'd be producing new printers. And all somebody has to have is a listening device. I guess that also speaks to the hot end that's in my hand right now. Mm -hmm. You can go on Amazon and there's three different companies that make a copy of this hot end. And If you look at the hot end itself... There's nothing special about it. No. All you have to do is take calipers and a CNC machine, and you can CNC mill one out in no time. Yeah. But as with any copy of something, there's still always something right. that they can't get perfect. Oh, yeah. Be Everybody it, says that these little hot ends, the, the uh, replicas, are just not as good. Right. It could come down to the type of aluminum or whatever metal those are made from. Mm-hmm. It could be some secret sauce that they're using in the cutting process. Yeah. I looked at because, I mean, they're 20 bucks mm-hmm. to buy the replicas. Right. And uh, I can't remember the names of the companies. I don't I don't really support what they're doing, so I don't really want to plug them anyway. Right. Because someone took the time to create an object and made it good that everybody wanted. They just crapped on it. Yeah, they just made a knockoff, and they're just trying to, to make a few bucks. Yeah. I did buy mine through uh, Matter Hackers, through Amazon, but this is a genuine E3D from the German company that makes them. Right. They probably just have a distributorship for the States. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they made this hot end, and it probably didn't take long for someone to go, I'm going to spend 80 bucks and then sell a million of them for 20 bucks. Right. I'm glad I, I stepped up and bought the, the good hot end that I wanted and really what it needed. And a lot of people are doing the Pico uh, hot end transfer. Mm-hmm. There's actually another kid on YouTube. I say kid, I, uh, no offense if you ever watch this. Uh, I've actually watched your videos. Uh, Dope Soner. He has a very, very detailed video on flashing the uh, the Da Vinci's. Mm-hmm. When I was made aware of what was happening with Luby and uh, Thingiverse and the uh, the company that was trying to screw everybody up out of a lot of things, uh, I wasn't concerned because Joe took it upon himself and he went. And, none of our none of our things on there. I'm like, for me, it's like I wasn't gonna make any money off of it. It granted a lot of it's just the the plain out point of someone pulling a jerk move and being yeah. trying to leech off somebody else's hard work which is wrong and i i do not advocate it at all just like not wanting to even mention the company that makes the knockoff e3ds yeah let's take a step to the side here and talk about something right up both of our alleys Uh-oh. we have star wars shirts on today yeah, bully. <laughs> gambody is a 3d marketplace for for gamers and they are selling a 3d printable model of the millennium falcon if you don't know what the Millennium Falcon is, you've been living under a rock, and you should probably go to Google and look it up right now. <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast, you know what the Millennium Falcon is. I, I would imagine most everybody into 3D printing knows of the Star Wars and Star Wars universe, at least the base universe, what was in the theaters. I'm not going to get into the expanded universe. I could talk for hours on the expanded universe, but that is a whole nother part of my life. <laughs> but it's so, really <laughs> So the folks over at Gambody have spent a staggering 800 hours modeling a highly intricate 134th scale replica of the Millennium Falcon, and it consists of 236 3D printable parts and requires at least three spools of filament to print. They aren't screwing around. No, they're not screwing around. And it is modeled with references from the Star Wars wiki sketches and materials. The 3D printed Falcon is one of the most impressive Star Wars 3D prints I have ever seen. Behind my Stormtrooper ship. <laughs> Behind your Stormtrooper ship. Now, I think detail-wise, this thing, it's, it's close. It's got to be pretty close to that. <laughs> <laughs> but... Don't get your hopes up too much if you're not ready for a massive project, though. 
the epic print of the spacecraft could take up to four months to build. Well, that is unless your 3D printer can jump to light speed. Gambody's ambitious Star Wars print is 717 millimeters wide, 1,000 millimeters deep, and 244.46 millimeters tall, and boasts an outrageous level of detail. The model is designed with the utmost precision from sketches approved by the Star Wars community and features secret compartments, a cockpit, engine departments, and wiring and ventilation systems. Despite its enormity, the 3D printable Falcon has been optimized for printing on small desktop 3D printers with no part larger than a small print bed. The size of each part is therefore manageable, but the sheer number of parts may not be. The Falcon's top and bottom hull consists of 176 parts, with additional internal elements making up another 60 pieces. The sheer scale of the 3D Millennium Falcon makes it a serious project for committed makers only. Gambody advises that 3D printing alone could take two to three months with a further month required for assembly makers can however opt against printing the entire internal structure of the spacecraft and by 3d printing only the shell printing and assembly time can be reduced and the hollow falcon can be used as a pc body or a hangable ornament Ermigard. pc body yeah you want a 3d millennium falcon computer uh pdx land you, we would be the coolest people <laughs> in all of the nerds. The thing is, they would have to build, I don't know, maybe a TIE fighter or something else. That would be awesome. Or even a Death Star. Anything. Krillian Corvettes, uh, uh, hell, a Slave 1 would be amazing. Slave 1 would be cool. A fire Spray would be awesome. Yeah. This is where we can go on forever about <laughs> the Star Wars universe. Um it's, it may sound sad, but we're really cool in our own minds. So, with so much time and effort put it into detailing the 3D printable Millennium Falcon, the STL file is not being given away for free. Yes. To start building the fastest hunk of junk of the galaxy, Game Body customers need to shell out $79.99. I am... I'm actually, I'm considering buying the model. I, I'm You're that big of a freaking geek. <laughs> it's a huge undertaking. It, I would have to find a very nice uh, imperial gray to print that in. Um, actually, it's probably a Carillion gray. <laughs> hardy horror. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, actually, I, I bet you Hatchbox's... Um, uh, silver would do really good. It might. Either way, we'll have a, a a link to the original article that this was taken from on our website. From the pictures in that article, it's, it's incredible the amount of detail in this. And it's amazing. I, I don't want to get to the point where I am painting every little thing. I, I could probably spend years. Take you back to the miniature days? Oh, dude. <laughs> Painting pewter miniatures. D and D miniatures. I haven't. Have I showed you my miniatures at all? Yes, you have. Okay. All right. So yeah, you've seen. Uh, I've taken far too much time, and I've had a few different hobbies yeah, in but it's my Star day. Wars. This is Star Wars. It's not like it's it's D and D. This is D and D. This is Star Wars. Yeah. I showed my wife that this morning. And she's like, "Wow!" I'm like, "It's seventy five bucks," and she's like, "And?" I'm like, "But it's seventy five bucks." She knows I love my hobbies, and you know it's better than me going and hookers you, and blackjack. Are you on the alcohol? Uh, yes, I'm on the alcohol. <laughs> Our last bit of news that we're going to talk about is gaming related. Mm -hmm. uh, we've both been playing Diablo three. Well, you've been playing a little bit more than I have. I've been and focusing. Even I've dropped off. Yeah, I've been focusing on other things, but there's been a game a company called Crate Entertainment. They announced. The game Grim Dawn, which is a Diablo-like action RPG that uses Titan Quest's engine back in January of 2010. Mm -hmm. So, uh, six years and two months ago. Somebody actually took time to put out a game and not just spit out a game. Right. So, after the announcement, 
in 2012, two years later, they collected over a half a million dollars through a successful Kickstarter campaign, and they were able to then put the game on early access in 2013. Fast forward a few more years, the game has finally been released. Mechanics-wise, Grim Dawn should be familiar, familiar to anybody who's played Diablo, or has played any of the Torchlights, or Path of Exile, or Titan Quest, which it is built on. You go through a four-act campaign on varying difficulty levels in a Victorian-inspired grim world, solving quests and slaughtering everything in your way. Sounds very much like Diablo. It is your yeah. point-and-click, hack-and-slash style game. Uh, you can create male or female characters at the start, and then you can decide on what class you want while you're playing. Well, then you can combine the class. Correct. So you're not basically, you're a mage, you're a fighter, you're a thief, you're a, a paladin or a crusader, if you want to get into Diablo terms. So besides being similar to Titan Quest game class system, you have several class masteries to pick from. And later on in the game, you can also dual class into something like a fighter mage or a mage summoner. Mm -hmm. So you're not stuck with just a fighter, just a mage. You can combine those classes. The game does come with built-in co-op multiplayer and modding tools that was promised post-launch. And you can pretty much figure that this is a Diablo dream clone. It is a full package. For me, like I said, I, I hit Diablo 3, the last patch, 2.4, fairly hard. Mm -hmm. I had dreams and aspirations of getting on uh, the top 1,000 front page. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility. That's, I don't have the time. That's a, it's a lot of time these guys invest into that. Unfortunately, what's happened with Diablo 3, um, so anybody not familiar with it, you get your gear, mm -hmm. you level to 70, but you continue to level and you gain what's called Paragon levels. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to increase uh, four different classes of abilities, and mainly stats. Right. So your first one is main stat. So if you're a caster, you have intellect. If you're a dexterity user, you can put points into dex. And if you're a barbarian or crusader, you use strength. Right. Uh, you can also put uh, points into vitality, uh, life, and uh, life actually lends to strength. And it, it just kind of keeps going on. You can put it into cooldown reduction, movement speed, which movement speed soft caps at 25% in uh, Diablo. The problem with the game is that they broke it when they did Paragon. They broke Diablo because now you're at the point where you can have the best gear. With the uh, Kanai's Cube, they added in uh, gem augments. So you can take a levelable gem, level it up to 100, throw your whatever your main stat is. In my case, it's been strength for my Barbarian and Crusader. And what you do is you combine the, the stat gem with the leveled gem. It destroys both, and you can put X amount, depending on your level of your leveled gem, of main stat on a piece of gear. Right. So you can do that. That'll give you your upgrade uh, and your ability to do higher level, uh, greater rifts. But now with Paragon being almost infinite, you have to be at 1,500 to 2,000 Paragon to be on the leaderboards at all. And the, the really crappy thing that they did was is a lot of people figured out they can uh, bot in Diablo. And all they do is they set a bot up, the bot continues to play, and you grind Paragon levels. So I've put in, I don't even know hours-wise that I've played on my Barbarian, but it's been a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm only at 600 Paragon. I'm in the 200s? Yeah. It, it's, it, and then all the game becomes is a grind for this Paragon. You're grinding just so you can make it to the leaderboards. And it's like, it doesn't even become skill based my barbarian's greater life forever level right now without augmenting or grinding out paragon i literally have to do what you call fishing for a rift i have to get the right map i have to get the right mobs the with right affixes and the right boss which any one of those can be completely negated by one of them being bad right as a charged barbarian you're very very what they call squishy in gaming so literally one thing looks at me wrong and i'm not doing the right thing at that moment in time i die Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it kind of turned me off of Diablo. I've, I've had a lot of fun with Diablo. I've played through, I think, three patches now, three seasons. I've played through first season, and this is season five now. Yep, we're in season, season so five. So I missed two, I missed two, three, and four. Wait, yep. no, I played through second part of second season because I have whatever stupid part of the set that they gave. They gave uh, two pieces of... Uh, clothing set in the first season and then a couple pieces in the second season but i didn't get the the rest of it 
Okay. So I think three and four I missed completely. I know I I finished out one, started two, three and four I missed. I've come back for five and my Crusader. I I like my Crusader. I have fun, but like I say, there's other things on my plate that I am needing to finish before I can devote a whole bunch of time to that. And Diablo is just a grindy game. It is. It's grindy and never changing. Right. You're literally doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And with finding a similar game like Grim Dawn, it's a new mechanic system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the seasons aspect. It's just a co-op. You'll go through with your friends and play a game, Mm -hmm. which I I really like doing. And it's a Victorian age setting. That plays into my, uh, you could say, wheelhouse of gaming. I really enjoy Victorian style games. Mm-hmm. Diablo's fun, but it's an alternate universe game. Right. And I guess it's kind of weird to say I would like to relate to the game I'm playing, but I do. I am very much into medieval. I love Renaissance fairs. So, if you're looking at playing a role playing game, D and D style game, Savage Worlds has a setting called gaslight i believe Mm -hmm. it's kind of steampunk very victorian age setting Uh, i have to see if i can talk to my buddy jay and he's got a copy of that see if i can can get it it's it's interesting it's very um steampunk back to grim dawn here it's on steam we'll put a link in our blog to the site and you can pick it up for 24.99 so for 25 bucks you get a a whole four-act game that you and your friends can play. Mm-hmm. Is there dungeon raiding type thing? I have not seen... Or is it seen, just a story mode? I have not seen if there is any type of dungeon raiding aspect to it. With Diablo, before they started adding rifts, that's all it was, really, was that anyway. Yeah. You just get on with your friends and go play and do your thing. It'd be interesting if they did add yeah. that at a, in a, at a later date. But even as it sits right now, just to get on and... Have something to play is fine by me. Yeah, definitely. And some, something just new. Yeah. Something to just kind of break. I mean, we do play Rocket League, but not enough. <laughs> but, and, and that's what Rocket League was. It was something new, something fun. It kind of just broke the whole monotony of gaming. And it was like, oh, this is fun. You can, it's kind of like Minecraft to me. Mine- they, they added new maps into Rocket League, too. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't played in such a long time. Oh, yeah. Either. It hasn't been since November since I played. Yeah. Yeah, because the last thing I saw is they were looking at adding hockey. They did, and I didn't care for it, honestly. It wasn't that fun. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to play that. And There's an expansion there that I want to get into and play some, but I've got an Xbox controller I need to fix before I can do that. Oh, yeah. Because the left thumbstick on my Xbox controller broke. Just one day I'm playing a game, set the controller down, pick it up, and it's just all floppy. Yeah, flopping around like a dead fish. <laughs> Damn you, Xbox. Dude, I've been using the heck out of that thing. <laughs> Gets knocked off the couch, off the edge of the couch. and I haven't thrown it. That's good. So I can at least say that <laughs> it was by no fault of my own. <laughs> I didn't but, do it. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. Well, well, as far as gaming goes, is there anything else we need to cover? I don't believe so, not for me. Like I said, I, I kind of fell off. I do play still. Diablo 3, but for the most part, I'm like, ooh, I want to try that. I try that, and I'm like, meh. And I see that's the thing is, we got a co-worker who plays also, and he's he's kind of the same way. He's like, well, I've been kind of bored, so I recreated my Demon Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, you know, you get on and be like, well, I'm really tired of trying to find this gear. Eh, let's make a Witch Doctor, or let's make a, a Mage, or let's make a whatever. <laughs> Actually, funny enough, uh, the said wor- co-worker and I played one night and rather than doing anything we kept opening Rimji Shire because I wanted the Spectral Blade <laughs> <laughs> the Rainbow Sword I wanted it I don't know why I just wanted it did you finally get trans- it? no <laughs> <laughs> I think we opened 15 or 20 Whimsy Shires and I was like I am tired of killing Sparkle Ponies and Care Bears <laughs> <laughs> so we, we we gave up on it and at some point I will. Uh, I will never make the staff, the bo- uh, the uh, staff of herding, to do it. People sink hours upon hours in trying to gather the mats for that thing. And no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that into this game. I don't really care that much. Said co-worker has one, and I just go, 
you're going to open this for me a lot of times. <laughs> and so we do. And it's kind of one of those things. I'm, I'm finally to the point. It's like in WoW when you finally got tired of doing whatever. And for me, one of the big time things I did is I sat and watched movies and waited for the time lost Proto Drake. The rarest mount in the game. He spawned one time a week. He had a chance to spawn in five different places in Northrend. And there was another aspect of it because he was a rare spawn. There can only be X amount of rare spawns in one zone. So if there was already the other rare spawn zoned in, he couldn't spawn there. They would go to the next one. And it was a random chance that he could spawn at all if he'd even tried. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I finally got him once. I just <laughs> I literally just started. Uh, I went through. Jeez. Uh, this was when Big Bang Theory was new. And I think there were two seasons in. So I went through the first two seasons of Big Bang Theory at least five times. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I watched movies upon movies. That's See, and that was, that's the thing. When Burning Crusade came out, they, they added a lot of these things. And I was just like, I have no interest in sitting there and going oh it's like f- it i've got better things to do f- grinding faction reputation oh yeah and when they made it to where the in- the uh the faction enchants were you had to have them to be a competent raider mm-hmm. i was like oh. they said my my hardcore raiding days ended when burning crusade launched i had a great 40 man guild we knew what we were doing, and when they split that to where you could only do 25, they didn't even do it to where you could take your 40 man and split it in half. You had to go find another 15 people. Yeah, they really borked that up for sure. Yeah. Yep, it was sad. I had lots of fun, but, you know, I'm doing this now, and I would rather be doing this. Me too. Uh, I still have that urge to game because gaming has always been for me a, just a release just to stop thinking about the projects that I have going on at work stop thinking about kids being sick getting to school going to karate going to sleep doing this doing that put on my headset and do that's why one of the reasons I like Minecraft so much because mm-hmm. I can just sit there and I can put blocks together I can make machines that breed and kill and cook chickens for me and I can sit there for hours trying to figure that out and, and... be okay and not frustrated and just be fine it's no, just need, mindless gaming. I need to get a new machine up and going. We had to shut our old server down, so we're right now without a Minecraft server. We are, and that's another thing that's coming up. And even with Grim Dawn coming, I want to start streaming to Twitch mm-hmm. really bad. My internet connection is stabled out enough where I think I can, for the most part, be okay with a stream. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to be like a nightly thing. It'll probably, if anything, be Friday nights, maybe even Saturday nights after the podcast. Hopefully Joe can join and we'll be able to, we'll pick a game and say, hey, we're going to stream this after the podcast. Go tune in. Yeah. Mostly just for fun. I, I don't plan on being like a partnered streamer with uh, Twitch. I just don't have the time to dedicate to that being a partnered streamer i mean you see guys a lot of guys start out when they're trying to become partnered they stream every day for a year chainer he streams 14 hours a day every day and it's like i can't do that yeah, and you I, watch and you watch this guy At the beginning of the season he looks like a normal person mm-hmm. right now dude he i feel sorry for the guy i love watching his streams he yeah. doesn't even go outside that's the thing that concerns me with getting into gaming heavily is i have a social have life flashbacks from the wow days that's what happens to me yeah just talking to a person was an awkward situation yep i completely lost all social mentality oh yeah yep i know exactly how that feels it was right in the feels so let's see what we can do about getting a new game going let's do it yeah all right let's see if uh Grim Dawn will work out for us, and if you guys hear about it and like it, give us a shout out and maybe we can play. Next week we'll let you know how things go, and then we'll post our Steam information up on uh, up on the website. Sounds good. Alright, and I guess that does it for this week. I'm Andrew. I'm Joe, and remember, if you can imagine it, you can print it.